today we will discuss about the investigation part of the infertility cases the most important investigation is transvaginal sonography i would recommend all of you those who are interested learning infertility in a very proper way those who want to progress those who want to do ovum pick up and transfer themselves they must start doing transvaginal sonography by themselves rather than relying on sonologist who do not who who may not be knowing the clinical aspect completely so when we do transvaginal sonography in general we see the shape of the uterus whether it is bulky any fibroid is there location of the fibroid number of the fibroid cyst in the ovary we measure ucl and cl because if we measure ucl and cl it becomes easier in future if this patient requires iui or ivf followed by embryo transfer we must note down the deviation of the cavity because many a time the cervix central lining of the cervix and central lining of the endometrial cavity doesn't match it is deviated it is not exactly antiverted or it's not exactly retroverted it is deviated so in that case we need to manipulate the passage of the catheter accordingly while doing iui or embryo transfer while doing sonography those who are having color doppler facility with them we must notice the vascularity of the uterus when you are observing multiple tiny sonolucent area in the myometrial wall especially in subserosal surface you must put on the colors and you will realize that the uterus is vascular congested the congested uterus very commonly seen in pcos chronic pid tuberculosis so it helps in differentiating these disorders from others while doing sonography we must notice the myometrial eco structure because in adenomyosis there is typical non homogeneous myometrial eco structure there is maybe sun rays appearance the wall either anterior or posterior wall may be thick the adenomyosis especially which are near the serosal surface and posteriorly are commonly associated with pelvic endometriosis there are another endometri- adenomyosis which causes changes in the some endometrial layer we must notice whether pouch of douglas has got free fluid or not the free fluid in the pouch of douglas can be physiological post ovulation or maybe as a result of pelvic inflammatory disease cox or it may be a important clue to presence of 
endometriosis. When we are doing transvaginal sonography, we must look for the probe tenderness because that will give a clue about PID as well as ectopic pregnancy if at all if it is missed clinically. Many a time when we are doing sonography we observe that either of ovary is absolutely posterior to the fundus. Two, two freely mobile ovaries can be in such position or it can be adherent ovary. If the ovary is adherent to the posterior surface of the uterus while doing ovum pickup in IVF to retrieve follicle to reach to a such ovary post to the posterior surface of the uterus becomes technically really difficult. In that case, the options left to us are either neglecting those follicles or to pass through the wall of the uterus which can be a traumatic, technically difficult. If it requires one or two puncture, it is still okay. But multiple follicles are there and if it requires more than two punctures, then chances of profuse bleeding intraperitoneally or maybe revealed from the vagina chances are very high. While doing a sonography, you must look for the sliding sign. So, you have to slide the cervix and uterus over the pelvic column. If you, if you can slide the whole uterus, I mean uterus and cervix and from the, uh, uh, on the pelvic column, then you can rule out deep pelvic endometriosis. But if you cannot slide, then chances of deep pelvic endometriosis may be there. So clinically, you have to correlate. Sometime, you come across the endometrial collection while doing transvaginal sonography. The endometrial collection may be as a result of hyperestrogenic status of hyperstimulation or maybe a sequelae of acute endometritis or maybe a collection of the fluid which has traversed, traveled from hydrosulfix. The management of endometrial collection we will discuss later on. You have to look for a polyp, especially if it is very small, less than 10 millimeter polyp, it is okay. If it is more than 10 millimeter, it definitely requires treatment. The shape of the cavity can be judged if you are doing transvaginal sonography carefully. The irregularity in the endometrium, irregularity in the shape of the uterus, endometrial texture whether it is triple line, hyperplastic, thick endometrium, you must notice. When you are doing sonography and in the endometrial area, if you are finding that it is not uniformly ecogenic or it may be a thick endometrium which is again irregular or you may find out 
some calcified spots this is these all findings are suggestive of intrauterine adhesions last but not the least the sonographically detectable hydrosalpings should never be missed because if sonographically detectable hydrosalpings is present it requires a removal or delinking at least to improve the chances of fertility because the hydrosalpings contains toxic inflammatory fluid which keeps pouring into the endometrial cavity and which hampers implantation of the embryo many times the hydrosalpings is not present when you do a basic sonography and once you start stimulating then on suddenly on one day you will find hydrosalpings it happens many time so these are the few points which you should not miss the patient may come for sonography at any part of month menstrual cycle what i mean to say suppose patient is coming on the early follicular phase day 2 day 3 day 4 something like that then apart from what we have discussed what else you would like to see on early follicular phase the most important is enteral follicle count till now we all were believing and still most of the people believe that enteral follicle count should be seen on day 3 only not later than that which is not true because there is always a group of follicle which are recruited at the periodically all throughout the menstrual cycle they are ready to be recruited so enteral follicle count can be measured in any phase of the menstrual cycle on day 2 or day 3 you must notice thick endometrium if there is thick endometrium on day 2 or day 3 it is suggestive of anovulatory bleeding chronic anovulation hyperplastic endometrium you must notice tenderness with the fluid in pouch of douglas which is again as we discussed suggest you of endometriosis or pid looking to the ovary you must notice the any evidence of luteinized unruptured follicle or any retained cyst or and the most important is pcos polycystic ovarian this is the typical follicular arrangement it can be a pulsing arrangement or maybe a well distributed uh, in the theca cells i mean uh, well distributed all out throughout the ovaries suppose patient is coming in the little later part of the follicular phase then you get a chance to know whether follicles are growing how is the effect of estrogen secreted by the follicle on endometrium whether endometrium is growing or not whether it's triple line endometrium is there or not so you get a chance to look and look into these important points suppose patient has come to you on day 20 something in in, in, the, <coughs> in the luteal phase then you have a chance to look for the evidence of corpus luteum you have chance to see the type of the endometrium whether endometrium has become secretory or not you have chance to see for luteinized unruptured follicle 
so if such thing happens then how to manage this we will discuss in some other talk another most important investigation is semen analysis as per the recent who guidelines the minimum criteria for normal semen analysis the volume should be minimum 1.5 ml the sperm count should be minimum 15 million per ml total motile sperm which is a very important criteria should be 39 million per ejaculate minimum the progressive motility should be at least 32% morphology should be at least 4% normal sperms present and vitality should be at least 58% after semen analysis the another important testing required is tubal patency testing tubal patency testing should not be advised very liberally to all the patients because either it is painful or it is costly depending on what technique or what invest modality of the investigations are you using for establishing tubal patency in our clinic we do when we feel that the tubal patency required to be established we do hysteroscopy we do transvaginal sonography before and after the hysteroscopic procedure and while hysteroscopic procedure we infuse a normal saline for the inflation of the endometrial cavity and if the tubes were patent any of one tube is patent then fluid would collect in the pouch of the glass so before discharge we do a transvaginal sonography and if the fluid is present at least we are sure about at least one patent tube an unilateral patent tube is sufficient for conception although she may take little longer time but yes the chances are very bright this procedure is hysteroscopy is done under general anesthesia so it is absolutely comfortable for the patient but if the patient is not financially well off and still you want to establish a tubal patency then hsg would be a right investigation but you must understand that hsg is very painful procedure and very few radiological clinic they provide adequate privacy proper atmosphere female attendant aseptic precautions so overall the hsg i am not in favor of doing hsg left and right if the patient's age is more than 34 years then i do not delay doing hsg because the age because of the running age i am worried about the egg quality the patient is suffering from infertility more than 5 years in this case also hsg should not be delayed if you are at any point of time while treating the patient if you are planning to use gonadotropin for the induction of ovulation or if you are planning for iui these are a costly treatment 
सो बिफोर एनी सेटिंग सच कॉस्टली ट्रीटमेंट एट लीस्ट ट्यूबल पेटेंसी शुड बी एस्टैब्लिश बिकॉज इफ द ट्यूब्स वेर ब्लॉक्ड दिस ट्रीटमेंट आर फ्रूटलेस सो वॉट आर दोज केसेस अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस टू केसेस विच वी डिस्कस एज मोर देन थर्टी फोर ईयर्स इनफर्टिलिटी मोर देन फाइव ईयर्स दोज वर प्लानिंग टू यूज गोनेड्रॉप इन फॉर इंडक्शन एंड दोज आर प्लानिंग फॉर आई यू आई सो विच आर दोज केसेस वेर यू कैन यू शुड सस्पेक्ट अ ट्यूबल प्रॉब्लम वेन देर इज ए हिस्ट्री ऑफ प्रीवियस एबडोमिनल सर्जरी विथ केसेज ऑफ सेकेंडरी इनफर्टिलिटी वेन पेशेंट एज गोट हिस्ट्री ऑफ कॉक्स और एपेंडिसाइटिस और एनी अदर ऑपरेशन वेन पेशेंट इज कंप्लेनिंग ऑफ डिस्पेरोनिया डिसमेनोरिया क्रॉनिक लोअर एबडोमिनल पेन विद इनक्रीज डिस्चार्ज फ्रॉम द प्राइवेट पार्ट दिस आर द पेशेंट वेर यू मस्ट सस्पेक्ट टिबल प्रॉब्लम देर आर फ्यू सेंटर्स हु आर वेरी मच कम्फर्टेबल इन डूइंग सलाइन एंड सोनो सलपिंगोग्राफी इन विच द एयर मिक्सचर ऑफ सलाइन विथ एयर इज सिस्टमेटिकली इंजेक्टेड इन द एंडोमेट्रियल कैविटी एंड इट इज व्यूड सोनोग्राफिकली इफ इट इज डन प्रॉपरली द इन्फॉर्मेशन विच यू गेट फ्रॉम दिस investigation is almost equivalent to doing hysteroscopy and other tubal patency test nowadays there are paper published who are advocating the investigation including the tubal patency test in single sitting only so what they advocate they do a saline air sonosalpingography and they take they view this procedure and they capture this procedure in a 3d volume so once the procedure when procedure going on is captured on 3d the patient is allowed to go back home immediately the radiologist would process the 3d picture do the analysis and will try to find out exactly what is the problem whether the tubes are patent or not if you become expert in this 3d sonography the time spent for most important investigations minimizes in same time you can establish the tubal patency there are a lot of center who advise laparoscopy and hysteroscopy left and right which is not ideal to subject the patient for such an invasive procedure we advise diagnostic laparoscopy and hysteroscopy when sonography has suspected the pathology like polyp or fibroid which is more than 2.85 cm earlier we used to believe that any fibroid which is disturbing the endometrial lining or more than 4 cm requires removal now this cut off has been reduced to 2.85 cm plus smaller than this fibroid but it is disturbing the endometrial lining requires removal when you are suspecting endometriosis adhesions when the ovarian cyst is more than 4 cm then we advise laparoscopy and hysteroscopy laparoscopy and hysteroscopy are must 
when the HSG findings are abnormal or inconclusive. Laparoscopy helps perfectly to rule out Cox. Another problem of PCOS. Incidentally, if you come across PCOS and if you are doing laparoscopy, stroscopy, you must do PCO drilling. Of course, you have to observe certain discipline. The puncture should not be more than four on each ovary, but it definitely helps in stimulation later on. The dose of gonadotropin is much decreased. The ovulation, ovulatory cycles are increased. So, if you come across the PCOS, you must do ovarian drilling. What are other lab, lab investigations which are required? We advise TSH for all the patients. We advise prolactin for the all the patients. But what about AMH? There are many centers who advise AMH in all the patients. But in our center, since it is a costly investigation, we restrict advising AMH when we find that enteral follicle count in any patient of any age less than 6 or if the patient's age is more than 34 or if patient is suffering from unexplained infertility more than 3 years of duration then we advise AMH. AMH is routinely advised before starting IVF. Because many of the center, they decide protocol based on AMH level. AMH level is advised when you are suspecting a poor responder or poor response to the stimulation before or operated for ovarian cyst or chocolate cyst chemotherapy or radiotherapy, AMH should be done. When there is a high basal LH, sorry, high basal FSH level along with the high basal E2, they are suspected poor responder, diminished ovarian reserve. In such case, AMH should be done for the confirmation of the diagnosis. A very new indication is recurrent pregnancy loss. AMH is must in all cases of recurrent pregnancy loss. Now coming to FSH. The indications are same as AMH plus in case of PCOS just to have knowledge about FSH LH ratio, we advise FSH level. Now, what are the reason of advising serum LH level? In all cases of PCOS, we advise serum LH level because if the basal LH level is high, it causes a lot of disturbance in the intra follicular hormonal environment and the egg quality either follicles are not growing or the egg quality is very poor. So we must know the basal LH level in all cases of PCOS, especially resistant PCOS. Another, when we want to confirm a down regulation, we do LH level. When you want to rule out over down regulation, then also we do serum LH level. When we want to rule out hypo hypo anovulation disorder, LH will guide us. 
in all cases of poor responder we measure serum lh level we measure lh by urinary kit especially to decide the timing of timed intercourse or iui another very interesting indication of doing urinary lh is while doing ivf when we have given agonist trigger and we want to judge whether agonist trigger has worked or not so we do a urinary lh testing 10 to 12 hours after agonist trigger if it is positive two lines are there then probably the agonist trigger has worked while frozen embryo transfer in natural cycle to decide the timing of the transfer and starting the progesterone we do urinary lh level when we are doing luteal stimulation protocol or luteal estrogen protocol we have to judge the timing of the ovulation perfectly so when the sonography facilities are not adequate we do we can do or we can estimate the time of or day of ovulation by using urinary lh kit or serum lh level if the facilities are there now coming to a e2 when we do measure e2 in some cases of the pcos we do measure estrogen level those pcos where the estrogen basal estrogen levels are high aromatase inhibitor would be beneficial when you are suspected suspecting a poor responder you measure lh sorry you measure e2 level and if the e2 is more than 75 they are early sign of diminished ovarian reserve to confirm down regulation in long agonist protocol we must measure e2 e2 should be less than 30 if there is cystic ovary at the time of starting of the stimulation and we want to decide whether this ovary is hormonally active or not then we do measure e2 and if e2 is more than 50 this cyst is hormonally active and which is not ideal to start stimulation in the presence of hormonally active cystic ovary so in that case we postpone the stimulation and we take other precaution other measures which will be discussed in some other talk the e2 is measured in many of the center as a part of monitoring of the stimulation in our center we do e2 level when we suspect hypo or hyper response to decide a costing and timing of the trigger apart from this we do advise post prandial blood sugar to all patient of pcos obes with bmi more than 27 and those who are having family history of diabetes the same kind of patient we advise fasting insulin level also we advise testosterone if there is a sign of hyperandrogenism we advise testosterone in elderly poor responder to decide whether dhea is likely to benefit or not we measure dhea if sign of hyperandrogenism is there and we want to differentiate whether this hyperandrogenism is adrenal origin or ovarian origin 
then we do DHES. In cases of resistant PCOS also we do measure DHES. 17 hydroxy progesterone. When there is hyperandrogenemia and we want to differentiate whether it is hyperandrogenemia is ovarian origin or extra ovarian origin. So this is a good test to decide that. We do measure progesterone commonly to rule out anovulation. If on day 21 or maybe you can say 7 days before the expected menstruation if the progesterone level is more than 3 nanogram it rule out, rules out anovulation. If it is more than 10 nanogram it assures reasonably about good luteal phase. Progesterone is again helpful to see a luteal adequacy. At the starting of the IVF cycle, we do progesterone to confirm down regulation and proper milieu of good oocytes quality. The most important time to measure which is commonly in most of the IVF center who still believe in transferring fresh cycle on the day of trigger to judge endometrial receptivity and to take decision about whether to transfer or freeze the embryos. The progesterone recently has been suggested to be measured to judge the adequacy of the agonist trigger. If the progesterone level is more than 3 nanogram 12 hours post agonist trigger, it gives assurance about adequacy of the trigger. Now coming to the TBPCR. When you are suspecting tuberculosis, TBPCR can add important information about TB. Many times the endometrium is persistently thin in spite of good number of follicles. There may be intrauterine adhesions. There may be par partial or complete block tubes. The patient of recurrent implantation failure there is a persistent free fluid in the pouch of Douglas, not drying up after the antibiotic course in the absence of endometriosis. These are the typical clinical pictures where you would like to rule out tuberculosis. A plus screening should be done when there is history of recurrent abortion or bad obstetric history. When there is a recurrent implantation failure, APLA screening is worthwhile. So this more or less completes the investigation aspect of female infertility. In next lecture, we will discuss to decide what is the probable cause of infertility after taking the history carefully and doing all those investigations which are required. Thank you.